Hello everybody, um, today I'm going to be talking about generators, order, and cycles. So first thing I'm going to talk about is generators. So let S be a subset of a group G. Now let H consist of products, right, x, um, or let me enumerate, x1, x1, x2, x1, x3, or x1, x2, x3, and so on and so forth, such that the x sub i are either coming from s or their inverses come from s. Then h, um, I'll use my shorthand notation, so I mentioned this at the end of the last video. Then h is a subgroup of g, and it is said to be generated by S. We write H is equal to um, S with these brackets, right? Okay, so um, the proof of this being a subgroup is essentially um, inductive. I mean, well, not inductive, I guess. Um, well, you have all the, uh, how should I say? Okay, so the reason why, um, clearly if I multiply any two of these elements, then I'm just going to get another one further along the sequence, right? And then uh, looking at this product of two, right, I can take x, um, I think I need to say this is a non-empty, non-empty subset. I can take any element, right, even if it's just one element, um, I can take that and its inverse. Um, and that will get me the identity. And of course, um, because of this property, um, anything in H, its inverse will be in there, right? Uh, the proof of that being, um, well, the inverse of one of these, um, uh, how should I say, right? H contains all of S. It also contains all the inverse elements of S. Um, and then if I have any product of elements, then, and I take the inverse, it's just going to be another product of those elements, not in the same order. Um, I should mention that uh, if I have a product and I take the inverse, it's not equal to x inverse y inverse, it's equal to y inverse x inverse. Um, but the point is, it's still going to be a product of those elements, and of course, um, each of them will have it's either in S or it's inverses in S, because that's what we started with. Um, so it, it's it's not hard to prove that this is a subgroup. Um, oops. Generated by S. Okay. The next thing, um, order, right? So we can uh, let Xn be the product of x with itself n times. And then we define x, zero, x to the 0 to be the identity element, and then x to the minus n to be x inverse with itself n times. Okay. 
Um, then for x and g, h, we can define a subgroup to be generated by that single element x. Um, this is going to consist of the multi the powers of x ranging over all integers, right? And um, of course, this is a generated group, or this is a generated subgroup. So we already know it's a subgroup, but you can assume, you can check as a special case that it's a subgroup, um, right? The product of two powers is a power because you add the exponents. Um, the identity is in there because uh, for n equals zero, you get x to the zero is the identity, and then inverses are in there because you have the negative of a power. Um, and this is called, this is cyclic sub subgroup. And so notice that within g, you can take, um, you can take any element and make one of these cyclic subgroups. Um, now the order of x and g is the least positive integer n such that x to the n equals e. Uh, if no such n exists, then uh, x has infinite order. And of course, notice for this to be the case, then g is an infinite set. So notice, right, if I have a finite set, um, then x must have some finite order because every time I multiply x with itself, I am necessarily getting another element of g. And if I keep multiplying x with itself over and over again, um, I have to get the identity. Now, it, that may not be um, completely obvious at first, right? I could just keep getting um, other elements that aren't the identity. Um, well, the reason is, so So what I'm saying is if um, g is a finite set, x and g has finite order. Uh, essentially, by pigeonhole principle, um, we would have to have x to the n equal x to the m, or say uh, n less than m. Then I can multiply by uh, the inverse on both sides, uh, which gives on one side e and on the other side x to the m minus n with m minus n being a positive integer. Right. And the reason, of course, we can use the pigeonhole principle is because g is a finite set. Um, Now, if n is equal to the order of x, then the size of the uh, cyclic group generated by x is exactly n, 
and this set is of course just e and then the powers of x up to n minus 1. Um, all of these powers are equal. Um, the powers x to the i, x to the j for i and j little 1 through n minus 1 are distinct because x to the i equal to x to the j for, say, i greater than j implies x, um, I can multiply by inverses on both sides and I get x to the j minus i and j minus i is less than n, contradicting uh, the minimality of n, right? n is the order of x, and the order is the smallest positive integer such that um, x raised to that integer is equal to the identity. So this immediately, or this um, contradicts that fact. Okay. Um, and that's pretty much all I want to say about this topic. It's not um, super complicated. Uh, there is one thing I want to say a little bit is that um, order orders can be used to show two groups are different. So in the next video, I will introduce formally what it means for two groups to be the same or different. Uh, and the terminology there is isomorphic or not isomorphic. And um, the nuance there is that two groups can be isomorphic even if their sets and their operations on the surface, they look different, um, but they can be encoding the same uh, group structure. Um, and so I'll show that an isomorphism must preserve the order of an element, i.e. if um, x has, an, has order n, in one group, and I have an isomorphism between the two groups, then f of x must be uh, order n in that other group. And so as an example of this, um, I will show that r and r minus 0 are not isomorphic, because R minus zero has an element of order two. Namely, negative one, but R does not. Right? Um, the reason being, right, if I'm in R, okay, order 2 means you satisfy x equals 0, but x is not equal to 0, and this has no solution. On the other hand, um, in R minus 0, Right, you can have x squared equals 1 and x not equals 1 as a solution. And so that's why they're not the same group. Um, 
on the other hand, R, R and R plus are actually isomorphic. Um, so this is again showing that, right, they don't have to be the same set, they don't have to have the same operation, uh, but they can be encoding the same group information. And, uh, and E to the X is an isomorphism from R to R plus, right? And of course, this is saying, right, um, this is encoding the information that uh, if I multiply an exponential, then I take the exponential of the sum, right? So here, right, I'm using um, the operation on R, and then here I'm using the operation on R plus. And of course, e to the x is a positive function. Um, and I'll go into more detail know what is an isomorphism uh, in the next video. So I hope to see you there.